this week on Quality Digest Live, we look at the economic pros and cons of renewable energy. Plus, is micromanagement really that bad? Well, we'll find out when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live from March 15th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief Dirk Ducharme. Well, as managers, we all know, I hope, that the best way to get to the bottom of an issue is to ask questions of the employees involved. But as Timothy Bednars, author of one of this week's columns, says, the questioner must act as an inner critical voice, which expands the other person's mind to skillfully develop deeper critical thinking abilities. In other words, the goal isn't just to get answers when you ask a question. A congruent goal, really, is to help the other person learn to think, uh, learn to think critically. For instance, it's often necessary to demonstrate that there may be other equally valid viewpoints. So you might ask a question like this. Uh, if we don't have access to blank, uh, what do you think should be done? So that, that kind of question gets them to kind of open up, think a little bit more expansively, not kind of narrow their, you know, narrow their thoughts, their viewpoints. Um, another idea that Bednars has is, is to make someone think about whether their argument or stance makes sense, is desirable and meaningful. Ask questions like, how does this information fit into the things we have already learned? And sometimes, Bednar says, it helps employees, and I like this one, helps employees to reflect on their personal argument, position, or stance. So you might ask, why do you think, why do you think the question you asked is important? In other words, you had a reason for asking this question. Why, is, why did you ask it? Why is it important to you? Or, and I like this one, why did you phrase the question in the way that you did? I and mean, you'll notice that the very often when you're, you're talking to somebody, um, you'll notice that sometimes the question is phrased interestingly. Mm -hmm. It isn't phrased the way maybe, the, the way somebody asks a question isn't the way you would expect someone to say it. And right in mm -hmm. there, there's a clue. So I think you know, going back and saying, why did you ask the question the way you asked it, really gives them an opportunity to say, well, yeah, you know, uh, here's what I'm thinking. And, and Bednar's whole point is that, um, when you're asking questions, obviously you have a goal, you're trying to get to the bottom of a problem, you're fi trying to find a solution to a problem, but at the same time, you want to get your employees to think critically. And the way to do that is to ask them the type of questions that get them to think critically. So you're looking for more than just yes or no answers, or you're looking more for just uh, you know, concrete uh, uh, concrete answers. You want that concreteness, but at the same time, you want them to think a little expansively, a little bit more uh, beyond uh, just giving you an answer and kind of get them to examine the problem for themselves. So, yeah, so it, asking questions is critical. Yeah, and I think it, it comes to the role of what's the role of a manager? I mean, is the role of a manager just to ask a question and get the answer that you want? Or is it to get different viewpoints and to help the, 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 the person that you're managing grow, grow into the job? I mean, there's, there's yes. different ways of looking at it. Yes, and, and I would say, and this is really a change that I think has come about, and maybe people might disagree with me in terms of time frame, but I would say probably in the last 30, 40 years, there has been that transition from the manager is there to tell you what to do yep. and you're there to answer to them to a, manager, a manager's goal is to help you grow. Mm -hmm. Obviously they've got to manage, they've got to get accomplished what needs to get accomplished, mm -hmm. but at the same time they should be helping employees grow into the next, yeah. uh, into the next manager, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Somebody who yeah. understands the process, who understands how to think, who yeah. understands how to uh, examine problems. Yeah, it helps the organization, it helps the, the person, him or herself, yep. and you know that role of the manager, you know, morphing from, from a dictator into a facilitator, right. as we've seen. And yeah, I think it, you're probably right. I think your time yeah. frame is about right, 30, 40 years is where we've seen that happen. So yep. good story by Timothy Bednarz, as always. Okay, another news item that we covered this week came to us from Gartner, the information technology research and advisory company. Gartner recently announced the winners of their Business Process Management Excellence Awards for North America. Business Process Management, or BPM, is a continuous improvement strategy designed to better align an organization's internal operations and resources with the requirements of its customers. It places a particular focus on innovation and the integrative use of technology. 
So the three winning organizations exemplify the breakthrough improvements that can happen when a company makes a commitment to BPM. The winners are Banco Supervalle, which was recognized for having the best business outcomes driven by BPM. San Joaquin County of California Information Systems Division was named as having the best BPM organization. And little known company by the name of Intel. Intel. Intel, Intel. yes, had a tough time finding that logo. <laughs> Intel <laughs> yeah, <I'll> <laughs> won for demonstrating the most effective use of BPM technology overall. The winners will describe their best in class BPM results at Gartner's Business Process Management Summit coming up on April 2nd in National Harbor, Maryland. So for more information on Gartner's BPM Excellence Awards, not to mention next month's summit, check out the story link just below the player page. In fact, as always, links to all the pieces that Dirk and I are going to be covering the show are available, again, right down there. Check it out. When I remember to put them in there. Put them up. Thank you, Dirk. We, we all appreciate that. Yeah, they're there they're eventually. Okay. One of our newer authors, uh, Garor Shridhar, contributed what I think was a pretty unique use for yeah. gauge R&R. &R. And, and to bring you up to speed, most of you probably know this, but if you don't know what gauge R&R &R is or gauge repeatability and pre reproducibility, it's a process that determines the amount of measurement variation introduced by the entire measurement system, which would include the measuring instrument itself as well as the individuals using the instrument. Both the instrument and the individual make up your measurement system. You don't have one without the other, usually. Uh, well, if you have an operator, anyway. So you can use a gauge, and I can use a gauge. Uh, the gauge itself has an error, but so does the way we also individually use the gauge. So typically when we think of gauge R&R, &R, we think of doing it on actual measurement gauges, the equipment used to measure something. But Shridhar, in his article, talks, uh, takes it actually further. He talks about doing gauge R&R &R on a service. Mm -hmm. And the service he uses as his case study, his real case study, is creating engineering drawings. So engineers in this service company uh, are primarily engaged in creating 3D models and generating manufacturing drawings from them. The project manager wants to know if the current measurement system and the peer reviewers, these are the people who are reviewing these documents, and, and, and other, uh, think of this another way, uh, we do editing. Mm -hmm. So we have a document and we have editors who look at it. When it comes to engineering drawings, you basically have the same thing. A drawing is, rec uh, is created and then you have people who go back and basically quote, edit the drawing, make sure that everything is there, is supposed to be there, and so forth. So they wanted to find out whether the peer reviewers were able to identify any errors in the drawing that were created from the 3D models. So in this scenario, gauge R&R, remember we're talking gauge R&R, is used to evaluate the consistency of the drawings drain up, generated by the th three engineers and to improve on any shortcomings through maybe uh, training or, or that sort of thing. So, Here's how the process works. When generating manufacturing drawings, variation comes from two sources. There's the differences between the drawings created by any process, mm -hmm. and there is imperfect quality control on the drawings. Uh, that is, uh, checking the same drawing repeatedly doesn't result in identical or consistent results. So think of a, of a traditional gauge r, r done on a physical part. The gauge is a mecha me mechanical measurement device, like a micrometer mm -hmm. or a caliper or something like that, and the part is a machine component. In this case study, the gauge is a checklist. Like kind of like we have our checklist when we edit, we, sure. we, look, for, we look for various things. Mm -hmm. So there's a checklist, and the part, quotes, to be checked is a drawing. So measurement system variability includes both the variations due to the gauge, the checklist, and the reviewer to reviewer variability. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 get, you, get the, you got the scenario here. Okay, yep. you have a reviewer going through a checklist to make sure the drawing has certain things, so the checklist is actually the gauge, or the gauge is actually the checklist. Mm -hmm. So for gauge R&R, &R, uh, they set up four drawings that represent the expected range of the process variation they took three engineers who created the drawings and they had them perform a blind review of the drawings using a predefined checklist. Each engineer, each engineer reviewed the drawings three times in random order and the data was analyzed using all the standard gauge R&R &R tools you would typically expect, mm -hmm. ANOVA, XBAR R mm -hmm. charts, sure. uh, and so forth. The article details the entire process. But what I thought was interesting at this is they were able to, in the end, to hone in on deficiencies in the checklist. Mm -hmm. They found out that the checklist itself wasn't as good as it could have been, and that led to variation to how people were using it mm -hmm. to check the drawing. 
And they also found out that the engin engineers themselves uh, had a lot of variation. So a combination of both training and improving the checklist enabled them to improve their overall process for creating and checking drawings. But so to me, what was interesting about this was he took this, and maybe this has been done before. I've just never I think heard it has of it. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think but it but I, it just the idea of taking something that we think normally you would use for a mechanical yeah. gauge yeah. and applying it to well, it's a we have something we're going to measure by. We'll call that a gauge. It's going to yeah. be a checklist, yeah. and we're going to we're not going to measure an object. We're going to measure a drawing, sure. and you can actually set up the same gauge R and R you would normally do, and you check the variability of the of the checkers, and you check the variability of your tool. Using all the same tools, you can go back and do a statistical analysis, and their statistical analysis showed them problem with the checklist, right. problem with the training. Yeah. Went back there, addressed both of those, and improved the quality of a, improved the quality of their product. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it was actually pretty cool. <laughs> it, it, is, it is pretty cool. It goes to the heart of what we talk about a lot in QDD and on the show is, is the fact that, that tools are there to be used. And if you can find a creative way to use it, gauge r and I mean, I think many people probably aren't using it for this purpose. But, right, right, right. But hey, it's, it's a good creative use of the, of the tool, right? I mean, right. And, if, and if you can get something out of it that maybe even wasn't intended to be used that way, but it works for you, okay, go for it. You know, yeah. why not? I mean, it's all, it's all about improving the process and whatever that process may be. And if it's checking drawings, I mean, you can consider a checklist a gauge. Sure, why not? If it hey, works, do it. I'll bet, like, standardized, standardized, <laughs> uh, what, do we, what, what do we need to talk about now? Standardized it processes? Standardized process, standardized work, yes. Standardized work. Is, yeah. is actually I bet very, that does the same thing. Very closely related to that. Thank you, Dirk. Do we have an article on that? We, uh, you know, funny you mentioned that, Dirk. How did you know? It's almost like it says up there. It's almost like it says <laughs> up there. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how that works. We did, Dirk. Thank you for saying that. We did have an article this week uh, from a gentleman by the name of James Bruton, Jim Bruton. Good guy. Uh, called When Micromanagement Works. Micromanagement Works by Jim Bruton appeared in Thursday's issue of QDD. And, you know, micromanagement sometimes given a bad name. But in this context, what Bruton's talking about here is, is using micromanagement to, to look very, very closely at the processes that people are doing and analyze how long they're taking to do that and, and what it means. Uh, essentially, it, this is it's kind of a controversial, uh, controversial and, topic. And he's, he's talking, in this particular case study, he's talking uh, basically kind of office, 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 office operations. Office right? operations. Right? Data which entry, is, that sort of thing. Which okay. is what Jim specializes in, okay. is, is looking at, at data, data entry and, and office operations. Where, because there's a lot of waste there. Yeah. Uh, let, let's be honest, there's a lot of waste there. So this is, as I started to say, this is kind of a controversial issue here. Because I think that uh, in Quality Circle, standardized work um, really, which, which Bruton refers to here as, as uh, predetermined time systems, PDTS predetermined time systems, really stems from the original work. I, I talked about this a lot because I, I think this guy was an interesting guy, Frederick Winslow Taylor, sure. uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Stopwatch. Stopwatch. <laughs> looking at, when that was in an industrial setting, yeah. uh, looking at people on, on the shop floor. But the idea that you're going to time somebody doing, doing an operation, and you're going to see what the baseline is for that, and you're going to make sure that everybody is at that baseline or better, and those that are are going to be retained, and maybe those that aren't are going to be fired or right. re-educated or something to, to come up to the standard. Re-educated, um, like so, that. In some way, uh, <laughs> re-something. Re um, but you know that concept was really prevalent in our industry before World War II. It was yeah. really something that was very prevalent. Now, Deming, after World War, World War II, and in the 50s and 60s and 70s and beyond, uh, really was the one, I think, primarily was responsible for really chipping away at, at, at the idea of, of what was known as scientific management, these time and motion studies that Winslow Taylor did. Um, because his big thing, of course, and this is a horrible paraphrase piece, I'm sure everybody out there is going to be nailing me on this one, but basically he said it's all about the system, right? I mean, the right. system itself has to be clean, and the variability of workers within the system is just the variability within the system. And, and you really shouldn't focus on looking at the workers, because they're all kind of just what they are. They do what they are. The average worker is going to do the average thing. More importantly, understand the capability of the, of the process itself, improve that, and then you'll the, that'll, that'll lift all the tides. Well. I don't think Deming was wrong. I mean, his red bead experiment showed that if you have a flawed system, no matter what the workers do, how they pull those beads out, they're going to get a certain amount of red beads based on the, the flaws and the variability in the system, right? right? And I think that's pretty well accepted. But I think there's something missing there. And I think that, that an adherence to that without looking at what Bruton's talking about here misses a key element here. Because, you know, we aren't just average workers. I mean, there isn't just a baseline and every worker is the same worker. I mean, every worker does processes and in a data entry environment, for instance, in an office, there can be a lot of variability. You know, there can be a lot of variability and, and the understanding of what the baselines are and looking at that and then understanding how to improve that 
and drive a lot of waste out of the system. I, I think it's valid. I think it's very valid. I think really what we're talking about here is, is a marriage of those two things. Um, if you really want to improve, you want to have breakthrough or improvement, I think, yes, you need to look at your process. You need to make sure that the capability of the process is to the point where it can support that. But you can't ignore the worker. You can't ex assume that every worker is just X. They're just X variable. Right. There's a lot of differences between those workers. Well, and that's actually, strangely enough, that's basically what I was talking about in my story yeah. there yeah. is, and, and basically a, a gauge R&R, &R, even if we're, in a previous example, we were talking about mm -hmm. documents, but even if you're doing a standard gauge R&R, &R, the reason you do it is because you know you're going to have variability in, in operators. You're, you're going to. Uh, I mean, they're human, so one's going to do a measurement slightly different than the other, and that's going to affect the results of the measurement itself. So. Sure, and, and you know, you want to have a certain level of proficiency. You know, our, our, our good partners, CMSC, is working on this, this proficiency testing and certification now for operators of, of portable 3D coordinate metrology uh, systems and, and, and processes. So I think that there's a big, there's a push here to understand that there's got to be baselines and people have to have a certain minimum level levels of proficiency that you can prove. Um, again, I mean, to me, your, your, your best bet is to combine those two things, right? You, you, I mean, certainly all of us out here, we have a lot of people in the audience, a lot of you out there are, are systems people who, who look at systems overall and and you know, maybe we assume that the workers are going to kind of, kind of do what we want them to do within the context of the system, and you kind of maybe forget a little bit about, about really making sure that the worker, him or herself, is as efficient as he or she could be. And, and I think the whole, the whole thing that, um, that ben, uh, not Ben Nars, but Br um, Bruton. Uh, that Bruton was Jim talking Bruton. about here is is you can go through and kind of standardize certain, you can examine your office movement, you, yeah. can, you can examine how long it takes to, keystrokes. you know, keystrokes and move it's a mouse. Thing. Yeah, and exactly. you, can, you can look at that and you can go, well, is there a, is there a, a faster process for doing data entry? That's right. It doesn't, doesn't mean you have to crack down on the employee. It doesn't mean you might have to train them right. to do their operations right. slightly right. differently. But, but, but the thing is, the message is you can't ignore it. You, have you can't to, ignore you, it, You have right. to consider that as a big factor if you want to eliminate waste. And he positions this as a lean initiative. This is a lean initiative where within these offices if you want to get rid of waste, this is a way to do it. If you want to run efficiently, if you want to run lean, you need to consider everything. You can't okay. just say, again, we're going we're to make the system do this and then the people within the system are going to do that. Right. It's, got a, it's all of a piece. It's all, it's all together in that if you really want to improve your system and improve your organization. I think it's, I think it's a point yeah. well taken. I mean, I think, I think he, he, he got right to the heart of it by saying that it was kind of a... Uh, Kind of a uh, a bit of a of a maybe something that, that isn't considered much anymore. But hey, Christopher, did you say we had a question? Yeah. Oh, we got a question. That's right. I keep forgetting to tell people this show is live. Um, regarding R and R, gauge R &R. How would yeah. gauge R and R, uh, our previous article? Oh, right. How would that work for other processes like contract review? Um, that's a good question. My my guess is it's the same it thing. Work the same fact, I would say it's exactly the same yeah. thing. Is you've got a um, you've got a contract, and I think there's a question about how easy it is for contracts to be filled out, how understandable are they, yeah. uh, who's reviewing the contract. Basically, I think if you read through that article, uh, and the, the link for it is, I think it's the third link underneath the yep. player page, I think that if you look at what uh, Garor did there, I think you'll understand what he's doing. And if you, if you know anybody who's done gauge R&R, &R, we're not experts on that, but I think somebody who has done a gauge R&R &R would immediately see the connection between a standard gauge R&R &R and using gauge R&R &R to look at uh, you know, a, a paper process, a document process, yeah. because really it's the same thing. You've got all that interaction. Matter of fact, I would say with a contract, you've got even more interaction. Yeah. You've got the person who has designed the contract, yeah. the legalese, whatever. You've got the person who fills out the contract, so how understandable is the contract? Mm -hmm. That's another variable. And who's doing the contract review? So you've got probably three different variables in there at least, at least that yeah. need to be looked I, at. I would say a gauge r, &R might be more important for, for this type of a process exactly, than, because than you've a got, checklist necessarily, yeah. because checklists should be less bouncing back and forth, you would yeah. think, possibly. But this is a lot more stakeholders, I think, yeah. in the contract review process. So, so I'd And by the way, if you've got a question related to that, um, Put a comment underneath that particular article with that question, and I'll make sure that uh, if Garor doesn't see it, I'll make sure to direct it toward him. Yep, we will. Okay. Um, well, Bill, Bill, did you read Bill Levinson's uh, article? Bill Levinson. You know, I, I, amazingly, Bill Levinson this week uh, started his article by talking about uh, Ford, Henry Ford. <laughs> Strange enough. And, <laughs> Imagine that. Bill Levinson talking about Henry, Henry Ford. Ford. It's, yeah. it's incredible. The, the first one. Yeah. The, the Henry Ford of <laughs> renewable energy. Right. Uh, Bill Levinson. Well, uh, this is kind of a, a, a drum that, uh, that Levinson beats quite often, but um, he really doesn't, 
he, he's, he's critical of um, government intervention in terms of uh, uh, cap and trade, uh, carbon tax, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And again, and he co comes at it from a slightly different direction in this article, but, but what, what Bill is trying to say here is, is, look, there's examples of where if you just let the market dictate mm -hmm. what's going to happen, mm -hmm. you're going to get the results that you want anyway. You just need to make sure that what you, what you want is attractive. And so he uses the example of excuse me, the, the automobile. So he says, look, you know, before the automobile, you had horses. Mm -hmm. Horses were wasteful, um, and particularly in an urban environment, they're dirty. I mean, that's why you had people who would go along street sweepers to sweep up horse poop, right? Yeah. Um, in an urban environment, and plus, you're feeding the horses yes. and sheltering them, mm -hmm. even when they're not working. Mm -hmm. So very wasteful, um, but they were inexpensive, relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So now you have the automobile comes along. At first, it's outrageously expensive. Nobody can afford it. Ford comes along, makes the automobile affordable to the average person. The, you know, the government and everybody, you know, uh, the government uh, creates an infrastructure, roads mm -hmm. to support it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, horses aren't so attractive for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, almost overnight practically, horses become more recreational yeah. than than necessary. But the primary reason for that was the fact that the price came down. The relative price of an automobile came down. It, it now, came down. So, so that's a key piece of this is, is to bring that, whatever that product is, you've got to make sure that it makes financial sense for the consumer because if you don't, it's never going to gain traction. And that's where he kind of launches into mm -hmm. the, his whole thing about uh, cap and trade and um, uh, carbon, carbon taxes yep. and so mm -hmm. forth. He, he said, look, once these products become a uh, thing, and he goes on about solar panels, he says once solar panels become cost effective, where, where the payback is quick, and mm -hmm. he describes how maybe they're at that point now, mm -hmm. people are going to start using things like uh, uh, photovoltaics because sure. now they're at a point where rather than looking at a 20-year payback, 25-year payback, which is what it used to be, yes. I, I know it was when I first looked at it, there's systems out there now that may have like a five-year payback, and now you're going, well, five years? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm willing to invest in that. Yeah, see, people want to do these things. I mean, there's the consciousness to want to do this and be sustainable. I think back to the, the whole thing about recycling, you know. I mean, people wanted to recycle years before the, 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 the companies, the garbage companies, got on it and said, hey, let me, let's give them a can. Right. Let's give them a separate uh, receptacle where they can throw out their recycling. And that increased recycling, you know, right. hundredfold, right? I mean, you, the system's got to be in place for the consumers to do what they want to do, and the financial systems are a big part of that. Right, but I had another thought on this, and he doesn't address this, and eh, I think a lot of people kind of skirt around this issue, is I think it is also possible, and, and in fact, I would say in many cases even likely, that if the government didn't step in and kind of start saying, oh, you know, we need these laws, we need to do this, that, and the other, would it bring it to our attention, w would those issues be at a, to our attention mm -hmm. the same amount they are as all of a sudden the government says, oh, we're going to start mandating this and doing this, that, and the other, and now all of a sudden, oh, this becomes a big issue. I don't want the government to step in, so now I'm going to make sure that, you know, you know, let's get these things in place so the government's not there. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering if it's a, kind of a chicken or the egg. Would these things actually happen I don't know. if the government didn't start kind of pushing it? Well, we could, we could find out by having the government remove the corn subsidy. See, <laughs> see, how that, see what happened with that. That would be interesting. None of you are from Iowa, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. That's just me riffing. For you people in Iowa, <laughs> you didn't hear that. But it is a fair I mean, point. It, yeah. it is, and, and I don't know, Ryan and I go back and forth on this a lot, is at the, and on the one hand, yeah, you don't want government intervention, but on the other hand, I think sometimes that if you don't have yeah. something back behind you pushing yeah. you, that it's just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'll get to it later. It's the bully pulpit. It's the old, right. it's the old, it's the original meaning of the bully pulpit was that you could use that to push those ideas out to the American populace. Right. And, and you know, maybe they're worth, I mean, in this case, I mean, hey, you know, you can look at it either way. I mean, certainly energy companies need to figure out a way to, to get their piece of this. Um, Maybe better than they are right now, and they will. Although BP yeah. just got out of it, yeah. but uh, photovoltaics anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that's the other thing. As soon as you have, a, as soon as they see a market for it, then you right. know there's going to be everybody out there trying to. Or, or if they see a market that threatens their market that they already have with natural gas or whatever it may be, I mean it's gonna it's gonna be something they have to either get into or in some way they're going to try to prevent happening, right? right? I mean, you know, the point I always make is you know you kind of you, you want to cannibalize your own business. 
You know, if you, have a, if you have an established business where you're up and running and you're doing well, like the energy industry obviously does very well, um, you want to cannibalize your own business. You want to co-op these new technologies coming in and own them yourself because if that's where it's going to go in 5, 10, 20, 50 years, you want to be there because if you don't cannibalize yourself, somebody's going to eat your lunch right. anyway. So right. yeah, yeah, you have to do it. You have to be doing that. And um, I'm actually surprised BP got out of that business. I didn't, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. Story. I think, uh, I'm pretty certain that's what I heard okay. is, is uh, they sold, they, they, they basically they were saying they weren't just, they just weren't making it. Even, yeah. even though solar panel sales have increased, have I mean, increased, they've yeah. increased quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think also they were undercut. Um, you know, the Chinese are yeah. making a lot of photovoltaics. Yeah. Um, uh, the price has really dropped, uh, but mostly from from uh, solar panels that come from China. Yeah. Uh, I think BP just probably felt they just couldn't compete and got out of it. So. But I think what Bill said, this is a bigger picture here. Bill's not really, I mean, sure, photovoltaic solar panels is where yeah. he enters this, but the discussion, what he's talking about here is kind of beyond that. It's really right. more of a philosophy of how products are brought into the marketplace and how yeah, if, if, if the market if the market's there mm -hmm. then people I mean if the if the desire is there the market will step in to feed it yep. and uh, you know kind of problem solved well and then you know hey that's the system we work in we assume we want it to be that way right that right. that y the pricing's got to be there the efficiency's got to be there the reliability's got to be there and all that takes time the barriers to entry for some of these things are really really high right and when you started looking at, at solar panels you know a, few, a decade or two ago, it, it, it wasn't as efficient. No, as no, as I mean, yeah, basically, and, and Bill points this out in the article, you know, 10 years ago, even 10 years ago, 15 years yeah. ago, you know, the, the, the return on it was, yeah, 20 years, yeah. I mean, or, or 15 years, and you're going, ah, oh, yeah, really, yeah. jeez. Why, why bother? Know, why, why bother? You know, yeah. but five years, yeah. you know, now, now it's beginning, and actually there's other options now that you don't even have to buy solar panels. You mm -hmm. can, there's other options out there, um, companies that'll just put them in for you and you're just, Paying them now for your your utility bills, but that's another another that's topic. Yeah. But it's but, but it's good stuff. I mean, yeah. Bill, you know, the thing about Bill is he 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 does tend to bring it back to the to the, to, to the same ground many times. But he all, he always raises compelling ways of getting there, and this right. is one that you know you think about. It, you're like, wow, that, that makes good sense. It's a really good analogy. If, if, if you want the math done for, for you on the cost effectiveness of photovoltaics, uh, Bill included all the math right mm -hmm. there in his uh, in his article. So, so check it out. Anyway, so, right down there. Um, well, we're almost at the end of our show. Uh, we, we are. We had. We wanted to, to point out to everyone before we go that we had. Uh, we last week had our second episode of Gauging Quality. That's right. That was uh, really interesting, Dark. You, you and Craig Cochran. I'm sorry, you and Craig <laughs> Howell uh, chatted uh, about about gauging history and right. and, uh, and looked at PQ Systems uh, software to talk about that. Yeah, uh, there was, it was actually was an interesting uh, interesting gauging quality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and basically it was about that the importance of excuse me, the, the importance of your gauge calibration history and what you can learn for that. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, see more on that, if you want to watch the whole episode, the link is at the very bottom of the links underneath your player page. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting what you can learn from your gauge calibration yeah. history. And a lot of people don't look at it, but there is a ton of information there. And that's actually what that program is about. That's right. Gauging, uh, gauging quality. We're going to be doing regular episodes of gauging quality later this year. So Keep an eye on your email. You'll be informed about upcoming episodes. Uh, we plan to have one uh, in April. Still nailing that down, but you can. Look hey, what have we got down so. here? What do we have down there, Dirk? You're reaching. Oh, 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 oh. You know, yeah, it, it, it's it's we, it's a birthday. It's a birthday today. Today, somebody yeah. we wanted to to acknowledge. <laughs> Mary Poppins, no, not Mary Poppins. It's actually Daniel Luna, our our uh, our oh. director, our intrepid uh, director, our, our blues our blues player. That's right. And uh, you know, Daniel really deserves a lot of applause, not only for working with you and me, but for working with Chris Smith as well. That really yeah, takes oh, a I lot. Tell you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Daniel, I know you're busy right now, so Dirk and I'll eat this for you. But uh, thanks, buddy. Happy birthday, man! And yeah. 26 uh, years old. God, he's, uh, he's, he's he doesn't look a day over I remember 14. That. So. God, God bless you, Dan. <laughs> yeah, we, just we, look at the over 14. We, yeah, we, that's about right. We, we 14 years old with a beard. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. We love you, man. So happy, happy birthday, birthday. buddy. <laughs> all right, that's our show. That's our show. Blow that up before the right. fire alarm's off. That's our show for this week. Thanks to you all for joining us. And, uh, and uh, we're going to have another great week of content coming up on Monday. And uh, next Friday, we'll be right back out here with QDL. So that's we'll, right. We'll see you then. So long. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.